tiny preamble. So I have an interest um, in the plague as a professional interest, but not the plague that I'm talking about today, although it's very strongly related. Um, it's in a different uh, organism um, that causes very similar clinical signs. I thought I would do this one today as a kind of reflection on COVID, although the amount of COVID information in here is tiny. But I thought it would be very useful to try and put this little lecture to you and then see whether we've got some interesting questions if we may at the end of that. Um, I think we've potentially got time over the course of the evening. Um, so that's my preamble to this, and I may as well start with my, my speech. I'm out of time or I'm ready. Sorry for the delay. Tears, bitter tears, fall in a bitter rain, and my heart trembles with a storm of sighs. When on your beauty bend my burning eyes, for whose soul's sake the world seems flat and vain. Life rushes by on proud, impatient feet, and death pursues her with massive stride. Ills past and present tear the soul aside. She stepped into my heart so vividly, a thing of light and warmth as well unknown, a princess having wandered from her throne. But now she is dead, and dead my soul in me. This was a poem written by the poet Petrarch in Italy in the 14th century as a result of the death of his unrequited love, uh, Laura. It occurred because of the plague, and she suffered, as did many, many individuals across the world. The plague was a horrible thing, also known as the Black Death in this medieval period, also known as the Great Pestilence. The purpose of this talk is to try and take you through a short, potted history of some aspects of the bubonic plague. It's also to highlight the scientific ignorance that was present at the time, and the situation with regard to beliefs, whether they were religious beliefs or prejudicial beliefs of another kind. It's also to describe to you, because I have a science background, some of the scientific method. That's my interest. And I think it's worth knowing from a broader public knowledge perspective. You could see that the level of knowledge and public discourse in this around the times of COVID, another pandemic, was appallingly poor. I want to make very brief comments on evolutionary psychology, which we might want to go into more in the, question, in the questions and answer session, but that's more controversial. And the last bit is just to provide a bit of contrast, as I said earlier, to COVID. Where did the plague come from? Well, in etymological terms of the word, it comes from the French, plage neclet, meaning evil or affliction. It comes before them from a Latin stem, meaning pestilence. How did it arrive in Europe? We're looking at a very precise date. There are multiple accounts of the arrival of the plague in medieval Europe at the port of Messina in Sicily, off the coast of Italy. It arrived in a group of boats that happened to appear from the Black Sea, and specifically from the region of Crimea. These guys sailed down and they docked in Messina and when the port authorities got on board, they found dead sailors everywhere. And of those that were alive, they were afflicted by boils, oozing pus and blood. The description of these plague symptoms was terrible. Not only did you get the classic boils or buboes, which are these lumps that you find particularly that are nodal, but they would appear also elsewhere on the body. Not only did you get these, but there were other forms of plague as well. Some people seem to drift through it very slowly. Some, a few, seem to recover. Many, and there are, there are multiple accounts of this in other ports around Europe as well, people could arrive in the port and within hours, not days, start to die. People would start, they often reported a headache, it was followed by no nasal bleeds or coughing up blood, and then they could just simply be dead. 
It's important to know that this was a devastating event from a mortality perspective. You were looking at up to 60% of people across Europe dying. The figures range from 15% in somewhere like Sardinia, all the way up to 80% documented in villages in England and in France. These are relatively accurate records. These were parish records kept of births, marriages, and deaths. They're not accurate medical records, but they are extraordinary rates of mortality. What was the understanding at the time of this? Well, the common understanding was a religious one. I happen to have picked on the Christian view, but there were views also well published in the Muslim world as well. The Christian view was that it was a lack of piety, and therefore we had brought upon ourselves the wrath of God. Or it was down to miasmas, which was a classic Greek description of disease from the time of Hippocrates, present for now over 2,000 years, a description of bad gases. Or it was down to witchcraft. And many cats were actually executed, poor things. I'm a veterinarian, by the way, for those who don't know. Um, and, but even worse, many people accused minority groups, and particularly the Jews, and hundreds of thousands of them were slaughtered in pogroms across Europe. And it's a fascinating um, tale there, kind of parallels with the modern day as well. Um, I mean, they were, they were absolutely they were burnt alive. Um, they, in some places, there are Christian bishop reports of how Jews were not to be suspected because, in fact, they seemed to die at the same rate as the Christians around them. And there were other places where there were suspicions that the Jews must have been poisoning children or poisoning wells, and they seemed to not be as affected. And we shall come back to that point if we have late, time later. It's an interesting point. This is actually um, a wood. Um, engraving on the bottom right here showing how the Jews were piled into pits and literally saddled with wood and burnt alive. What else did religion give us at that time other than the natural thought of comfort? It also gave us this which was the Society of Flagellants and this spread throughout Europe was particularly popular in Hungary and Austria and that basically led to the um, crossing of the flesh, a la the sort of Da Vinci mode type novels, if, you, if you've read that sort of thing, and a great belief that that could solve the potential problems um, of the, the world and the wrath of God. In other words, I wouldn't write no clue, but I mean, I want to put, let's put it in a more diplomatic way, no scientific idea. And that's an important push point that I want to make today. I don't want to be too negative on this, and I'm aware that I could be accused of being that, and I'm a Johnny foreigner in a religious country, but I want to point out that every person in this room has a greater level of knowledge of the plague being a disease, and not the cause of some superstitious event. You have more knowledge, even if you have next to no school level knowledge of biological knowledge or medical knowledge, you have more knowledge than the entirety of humanity in the 14th century, never mind the time that the Bible or the Quran or the Torah was written. What was the consequence of the Black Death? The consequence of the Black Death was that it led to the death of feudalism. There were massive economic changes. There were massive societal structural changes that led to, for example, the wealth of the Renaissance subsequently, an age of exploration, and the appearance of people in South Africa. You could even say these are all knock-on effects. I'm talking about foreign European colonizers coming into South Africa. It also had the effect of decreasing religiosity. When we talk about that medieval plague, that medieval plague occurred in the 14th century in theory and then went on to, say, the 16th century. There are arguments about when it seemed to die out. That plague is known as the second plague, the Black Death. In fact, there was a preceding plague, which was called the Justinian Plague in 500 AD, time of the Roman, just after the time of the Roman Empire. Um, and there's also, in fact, another one before that, but people got mixed up, so we're going to call that the first plague. That's the second medieval. And then the third was in a province of China called Yunnan, 
And that started off in the late 18th century. Shi Danon was a poet in Yunnan, and he was a young man, and he was one of the first people, who was the first, let's say, written example of documenting the association of the plague with rats, which of course you will know and will come back to. His poem was Dead Rats in the East, Dead Rats in the West, as if they were tigers. Indeed are the people scared. A few days following the death of the rats, men pass away like falling walls. Deaths in one day are numberless. It's just the first stanza. And I think it was a very interesting observation that was repeated in India as well, but funnily enough, not in Europe. Now at this time, science had moved on. Bear in mind from that earlier lecture I gave to you on projection a long time back that the microscope had been developed by Lee Van Hook in the 17th century. And so you were looking at now medical science and biological sciences having had a tale of time to start investigating other levels of non-visible disease. These two guys were instrumental. The guy on the left is Alexander Yersin, and he was from the Pasteur Institute in Paris. The guy on the right is Kitasato, and he was a Japanese doctor. Both of these men were sent by their respective governments into Hong Kong. The plague could spread from the southwest province of Yunnan and had appeared in Hong Kong, which at the time was part of the British Empire. Everyone around the world was aware and was very worried about the consequences of this. Everyone knew how Hong Kong was a strong shipping and commercial point to the rest of the world. And in fact, they were right, because within a very short period of time, it had spread to British India, and then it spread to America, and so it became the third great plague. That's why there was foreign interest in intervening early. And these men arrived in Hong Kong and put themselves at great risk now, the man who got the credit for it was Alexander Yersin. But in fact, subsequently, the Japanese bloke who also published a science paper on this at the same time has also been credited with it. And what they did was they did part of what we would regard as classical scientific medicine. They documented the clinical signs in their patients. They carried out autopsies in them when they died. They showed that by microscopic examination, unequivocally, you could find the bacteria present in the tissues of those who were dead. You could stain them and you could culture them, and so you could isolate the bacteria. You could then take that isolated bacteria and reintroduce it, rather nastily, into other animals, and they would die. You could document their clinical signs before they died. And then you could autopsy those animals and you could demonstrate exactly the same present bacteria present in those animals as had been in the original human patient. This is a simplistic methodology now, but at the time it was something that had been developed over a couple of hundred years following something called Cox postulates in medicine, and it's a relatively strong causation-based proof. Both men also not documented the death of wild rats in houses. Both men suspected that the rats were transmitting the disease to humans. Both men demonstrated the presence of those bacteria in those rat tissues. That one slide tells you something, that for the entirety of humanity up until that point, nobody else had any clue. And now, some of you, if I were to have quizzed you blind in this room, you might turn around and say, well, the plague, what is that? Is that a bacteria or a virus? You know, maybe you work in retail, maybe you work in engineering, it's not in your subject area. But most of you, you know, as soon as I say, no, it's a bacteria, you know that straight away. And you know something about bacteria, and you know more about it. And no one ever knew a damn thing before the publication of this material. At that point, at those black and white sepia-type photographs were taken, there were still many doctors throughout the world who held to the belief, published at the time, that the third great plague was due to miasmas, meaning bad gases. The same theory that Hippocrates had stuck to millennia before. So all of this time, the plague had been an unknown, and now it was attributed to this bacteria by Yersinin and uh, Kitasato, and so they thought, okay, that's the problem solved. You know what? That's the third great plague. Many of the patients were similar to the second plague, so we'll assume that the great black death of Europe in the medieval period is the same thing. 
And we'll assume that the deaths reported by the Romans in the Justinian plague, that'll be the same thing too. It was a reasonable assumption, of course, nobody's got any proof. And then somebody turned around in 1970 and said, hang on a minute, this guy Shrewsbury, based at the University of Birmingham, had gone through very, very detailed accounts of people dying in England, parish descriptions of those people in England. And he had, pub he had clearly documented, as had been the case in places elsewhere in Europe, that the rapidity of spread of this disease, the Black Death, was not the same as had been seen in the Third Great Plague in Hong Kong and elsewhere. No, it was, there were documented examples where it was a hell of a lot faster. And that was really a concern. And then they looked at it from an epidemiological perspective. So they looked at it from a, a disease modeling, a mathematical-based perspective. And they found it unreasonable that a bacteria could cause the rapidity of death the spectrum of clinical signs, they suspected that there was either an additional cause or that the people had got it wrong. In fact, it was brutally questioned, even as recently as 2008. The Black Death is not the same thing. It isn't the same thing. It must be due to something else, like a hemorrhagic filovirus, an Ebola type agent. That must be the reason as to why there were documented examples of people dying within hours of coming off the ships in Genoa back in the 14th century, or in Messina or anywhere else. To bring you up to speed, because this is very different from when you were at school, you can see this group of papers here in small print over here, but it stems from an initial report in 1998, all the way up to detailed studies in 2011 and actually beyond, you'll see in a minute. And what they did was they started digging up plague pit graves. And then they used paleogenetics, so that is hunting for DNA in ancient skeletons. And the best way that they found to do that was to take out the teeth from those skulls, drill through the enamel, which as you know is extremely hard, get into the dental pulp cavity, and take residual um, uh, material from that dental pulp cavity that had been preserved for hundreds of years, and then use that for DNA analysis. What did they find? They found, indeed, that the DNA was of Yersinia pest pestis, the very bacteria that had been named after Alexander Yersin, the causative agent of the third plague, the plague of Hong Kong, was found exactly that organism was found within the bodies of these medieval burial pits. You could not find it in people who had died before that period. You could not find it in the soil. You could not find it from people who died of other causes. You could only find it in people that were attributed to have died of the pestilence. It was a nice scientific demonstration, again, of the causative agent now of the medieval, medieval period unequivocally. And now I'm going to take you right up close to the end of this talk. This is a map, and over here on the left you can see that it's a bit of a distorted world. There's Africa there, we're down there, there's a bit of Australia. And now we're up in this region here, which is Kyrgyzstan. So there's China, there's Kyrgyzstan. There's a, a historian, a bloke called Philip Slavik, based at the University of Stirling in Scotland. And he's looking through records of deaths and he's not unaware of the fact that there's controversy about where the plague had originated from, okay? And he notices that there's a surge in deaths in the late 1330s, and he sees that in these old records, there's a massive spike in deaths. Look at down the bottom here, this is all the way down to about 1248, based on cemetery gravestones, and all the way up to here, and that spike that you see there, that's the sudden jump in deaths. And he thinks that's very interesting. And so they go and start finding out what's happened, and they mount an archaeological dig in this area. And this is a tombstone from one of those graves in one of those two cemetery sites. And it legibly describes in Syria the, the word Maltana, if I'm pronouncing that properly, which means pestilence in that language. And this 
was then the information that they handed over to a team of geneticists from Germany in this multidisciplinary, multi-center study. And these are the graves of the individuals that were buried there. And these graves are marked according to a little geographical map of whether there might be crossover contamination, drainage, or whatever else. And what they've shown is that they've investigated all the graves that were from earlier, pre-plague, and they investigated the graves that were reported to be pestilence, and guess what they found in the dental pole cavity of those, of those, of those bodies, sorry? They found the plague. What they also found when they fulfilled the genetic analysis was that it was the, the starting point. It was the primordial genetic example of all the plagues that had spread out across the Middle East, into Europe, over to China. So they were able to date it. The date of this study, which was published in Nature, a very prestigious scientific journal, was last year. What was doing it? Well, in fact, before they got to these burials, they already knew from various studies that had been conducted zoologically for over 160 years now, including a lot of work done in the former Soviet Union, that these marmots, a similar sort of animal that you see here, so this one's another rodent but related to the squirrel family, was, the, was probably the cause. And a marvelous paper put out by his, an historian um, called Green, published in an American journal. She has put all of this genetic evidence alongside paper evidence, and she has come up with a new theory as to what happened. So sure enough, there's lots of data across multiple scientific fields that the plague originated in this area of Central Asia. And what she did was correlate it with Mongol horde movements. This descendant called Jani Beg Khan who was a descendant of Genghis Khan, was known to have besieged Fedosia in, in the Crimea, where you see the tip of that purple arrow. He did so in 1347, the same year that the ships came down to Messina. These guys, the Mongols, who were busy invading and had been doing so, and he was like the seventh generation on, by the way, so we would be the good, having 150 years since Genghis Khan had been around, this guy was busy taking a trebuchet and catapulting dead bodies of plague-infected people into the town in Crimea. You think it's all over? It's not. This is a modern-day Mongolian hunter with a photograph taken in 1990, still killing marmots. Apparently, they're really delicious if you roast them over a fire and stew them. I know I have a slightly over, but just for effect, I've got to do this. <laughs> you are a racist, good sir. Sure. And you, man, you are a racist as well. Never point to your audience. Um, <laughs> I'll get to that I, later. I can't, I can't, I can't go into this in detail, but we can do it in the questions bit. Has anyone heard of behavioral, the behavioral immune system? No? Okay, it's a strong you have good. Yeah, because yeah. you taught me. Yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the behavioral immune system um, has, has been discussed in the scientific community for a while now. And it's a concept that basically we're all racist, which we are. You can see that when you put people in a functional MRI scan. If you show them a face of someone other, then the first thing that flashes up is risk. Okay, it's, it's warning. It's easily overcome. You can do it just by changing football team t-shirts, for example, right? So, I mean, you know, I mean, that, that will dominate over racism. But the natural response is racism. And the natural response is racism for a bloody good reason. And that is that we tend to think of deaths being down to, you know, I don't know, road accidents and maybe nasty wars and so on. It is dwarfed in the history of humanity and animals by the deaths by disease. And so it is natural for you to be conservative when approaching someone who doesn't look like you. More Mesoamericans died than were killed by conquistadors from smallpox. Okay? More people died of the plague than were ever killed by Genghis Khan's hordes. If you think it's over, it's not. These are examples of modern day um, plague symptoms. 
This is the first sighting as of 2016. There were three and a half thousand cases in the last few years in Madagascar alone. My last slide is this, and I said it was going to be brief, but I want you to reflect on it. The Black Death crude mortality rate is probably reasonably estimated at 60%. Look around the room, only 40% of you are alive if you're in the medieval period. It's an astonishing death rate. <clears throat> Versus the COVID crude mortality rate of, let's call it, about 0.2%. I really will finish with this, and it's a comment by Agnola de Tura, a shoemaker in Siena in Italy. Lastly, it was a cruel and horrible thing. They would swell beneath the armpits and in the groin and fall over while talking. Father, abandoned child, wife, husband, one brother, another. For this illness seemed to strike through breath and sight, and so they died. In many places in Siena, great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of the dead, and they died by their hundreds, both day and night. I buried my five children with my own hands. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. Thank you.